listening to the Virtual CISO Podcast. Providing the best insight on information security and security IT advice to business leaders everywhere. Uh, hey there, and welcome to yet another episode of the Virtual CISO Podcast. Uh, with you, as always, John Very, your host. And with me today, not one, but two. Uh, and hopefully that means that they'll be twice as smart as if they were a single individual. Uh, Mr. Ryan Mackey and Mr. Danny Mamimbo, both uh, multiple-time guests on the podcast prior. Hey, guys. Hey, John. Thanks for having us back. Yeah, well, you know, if you hadn't done a good job, you wouldn't be back. Um, <laughs> and we're just, for anyone who remembers Ryan's last visit, we're all just going to pray his internet connection holds up. <laughs> and that'll probably be not the last time that we make fun of Ryan, you know, no, <laughs> join the podcast. Get <laughs> no, thank you. you got those broad shoulders. <laughs> so... So it's a little bit awkward here because, like, normally, you know, you guys have both been on before, and usually we do that a little bit about who you are, but people should know who you are by now. Why don't we do a, we'll change it up a little bit? Um, why don't you give a brief, why don't you guys give, like, a, a brief um, synopsis of Shellman and some of the things that they're doing these days? Ryan, I'll elect you since you uh, ducked out last time. What's that? I said I'll elect you since you ducked out last time. Okay. <laughs> well, so John Shellman, we are a CPA firm and an assessment, cybersecurity assessment firm. Uh, you know, we, we deal with uh, the attestation work from the ISCPA, SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3. Uh, but we also do a lot of uh, ISO work, which is going to be the topic for this call, and uh, high trust, uh, FedRAMP, uh, PCI, um, cybersecurity work that would include pen testing, vulnerability assessments, whatnot. So. If you think about it this way, we're, we're the trusted you know, auditor. We don't do any advisory work. And so if there's some sort of technology or security framework out there that can be assessed against, that's likely what we're going to be doing. Gotcha. And if I'm not mistaken, you guys added TSACs to your portfolio recently, I think I saw. We did. We did. Yeah, we're starting yeah. to see a lot of activity around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Now, I, this is, of course, what I've asked you guys before you, what your drink of choice is. So maybe I'll change it up and just ask you the question. Have you had anything interesting to drink recently? <laughs> oh. Danny, you want to so, start? So uh, I, I talked about last time uh, outside of alcohol. I do, I do a lot of uh, coffee. So mm -hmm. I recently stumbled upon uh, Death Wish coffee. <laughs> it's supposed yeah. to be the strongest coffee in the world. And uh, it's not a lie. So it's, <laughs> I got to use it pretty... Uh, Pretty sparingly, but uh, I've been I've been dabbling with that lately. That's something I wish I would have found out about in college. I think. Yeah, that uh, definitely uh, helps. Is it, the, is it uh, like the afternoon crash? Is it just ca caffeine, just a jolt? It's uh, so it's a different blend of beans. I you know I'd, I'd have to go look at the the label, but I think all coffee was with uh, what is it arabica? I'll probably say it wrong. Yeah, arabica uh, is Colombia. Colum Colombia. It's a certain yeah. blend of that and another type of bean, but they just use more of of, of one of them. Uh, to somehow make their coffee just the caffeine content. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite the experience. And anything interesting from you, Ryan? You know, I, I, I was at a friend's 50th birthday party, and so um, not quite interesting, but there were, there were a, a number of different jello shots. <laughs> So, yeah. so you guys trying to re recapture, hit 50, try to recapture the youth. Did, did you guys go out and buy yes. sports cars right afterwards? <laughs> you know, was, um, uh, a lot of us that went to college together. So, uh, you know, all, all the memories started flowing back. It was, uh, yeah, it, I haven't had one of those in about 30 years. Yeah, and you probably won't have one for another 30. At that 80th probably. birthday party, when you guys get together, you'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll pull them out again, right? With your teeth. You 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 take the teeth out first, yeah, then the teeth, then yeah. the, then do the it, shot. It goes down smoother. Yeah, yeah. I had a uh, I was in uh, uh, I'd never been uh, first time I was ever in Dominican Republic, and I mm. I had a drink down there which was really cool called Mama Joanna. Uh, it's this oh. strange combination of uh, mm. aged rum, red wine, and honey, and it is it's okay. served in a bottle, and the bottle is jam packed with like bark and herbs. So, like, okay. when you pour the bottle out, like, literally you get half of the liquid fluid because, I mean, that's literally how, many, how much uh, bark and herb there is in there. Um, but apparently they've been doing it down there for hundreds of years, and I kind of fell in love with it uh, as sort of an aperitif, you know, late-night thing. And supposedly mm -hmm. it's an aphrodisiac. So uh, my wife probably okay. – my wife wasn't happy when I bought a bottle to bring home with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So enough fun and frivolity. Uh so 27,001 colon 2022 is official. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, 
many of our clients, and I'm sure many of your clients, are looking to move to the new standard. Um, mm -hmm. So first question for you is, when will registrars and the accreditation bodies be ready to certify a company to the new standard? Yeah, so I'll jump in on this, Ryan, and feel free to feel free to add on. But uh, so, John, as you know, so that this standard after a lot of, a lot of build up, definitely over a year of uh, <clears throat> anticipation and delays, as 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 we get to know with with ISO, um, it got published in in late October, right? Um, but we weren't able to, to to your point to do certification audits against that until we had our accreditation updated with our accreditation bodies. So we we're, we're with uh, ANAB in, in the U.S. And, and UCAS in the U.K. So we're actually going through that process with them currently, um, and hoping to have our accreditations here at Shellman, you know, updated by the end of the end of the quarter. So end of March. Yeah, yeah, and John, I mean, you you probably know it. If you don't, it's it's a free standard to get. So, um, you know, ISO comes out with standards, you know, but sometimes the guidance is missing. So the International Accreditation Forum, which is the IAF, they came out with, uh, well, they have a host of different, what they call mandatory documents. Um, this one for the ISO transition for 2022 for 27001 is what they call mandatory document 26. So it's MD26. Uh, again, you can search it up. It's free. You mm -hmm. can get a copy of it. Um, it was actually updated two days ago. Yeah. <laughs> so this is fresh data. So, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry. Take a, can we take a step back for a second? Because I'm, I'm yeah. not sure I'm following you. Are you saying yeah. That, yeah. That, that every ISO document that I've ever gotten, has you, you pay for it? Are you saying that ISO yeah. 27001 colon 2022 is no longer something you have to pay for? No, it is something you have to pay yeah, for. Okay. So the, yeah. the International Accreditation Forum is basically the conglomerate, global conglomerate of accreditation bodies. Okay. And so what they do is they, they come out with guidance standards on ISO standards. Oh, I gotcha. So those, yeah. the, those documents that they come out with are free. Okay. Right? And you called that MD26? So I have not MD26. seen that. Okay. Yeah, MD26. Yeah. And um, like I said, we, we actually had a lot of content and info out there off of uh, version one of MD26, yeah. uh, which was, again, just recently updated two days ago. So some of some of the content we've got out there was uh, was well, it needs to be updated. Yeah. Um, but uh, but the, the guidance there is that the accreditation bodies, they have six months to be able to get ready to assess organizations against or certification bodies against a 2022 program. Right. So now UCAS and ADB, as Danny had mentioned, um, in January, they already released that they were ready. Okay. You know, so they, they've got an application process. So if, if your certification body is accredited by one of them, um, you can go through that process. Our timeline for certification bodies, we've got a year from the date of the 2022 publication to go through that transition process. Mm -hmm. So by October 31st of 2023, all certification bodies have to be, you know, able can we, to- Can you, when you say, uh, so, so real yeah. quick, just to make sure people yeah. are following along, certification body equals registrar, accreditation right. body yeah. equals yeah. U, 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 ANAB, UCAS. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so what you're yeah. saying is that as the ABs, the accreditation bodies are already ready, the CBs or registrars have up to one year to, be, to, to get ready. And what you're saying that's is that you're going to be ready before that. You're going to be ready, right. you know, this quarter. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Do you expect just? Do you expect most registrars will be in a position to to do that sooner than a year? I would hope so. Yeah. Um, you know, the expectation is yes. Um, you know, from a standards perspective, you know, a lot of the management system is going to be the same. You know, between 2013 and 2022. So it's the methodology and the approach for the control set. Um, obviously, you got to get your team trained up on that new control set, understanding you know how to test it, and whatnot. Um, you know, so there there are activities that all certification bodies have to make sure that they can demonstrate as part of that application process. But um, you know, given that there's a lot of organizations out there that are certified and they want to demonstrate that they are certified against the 2022 version. Um, most certification bodies would be wise to yeah. start this as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about, so most of the people yeah. that are listening are not part of a certification body or registrar. They're the, they're the people that you work with, like us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we just finished our audit with you guys uh, today, actually. Well, yeah, yeah. technically. Uh, with the the uh, closeout meeting is next week. Um, okay. The, 
So let's talk about somebody listening to this that is thinking about getting ISO 27001 certified. So let's say they're not yet certified. Uh, and they began the process, and they started with ISO 27001 colon 2013. Are they hosed? No. Okay. They, they, they were hosed more in version one, <laughs> this version two of that MD26 document. Yeah. Um, they've got a little bit more leeway. Uh, before, the requirement was that by October 31st, we can't issue any new certs against 2013. Of this year. Right? So what they've done is they pushed that out to April 30th of 2024. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, I'd always heard 30, uh, that October 31st was, the, yeah. was that deadline. So that's actually interesting. Do you think that that really matters that much? Because I think anybody that started the process already probably was already using 2022 right. guidance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it depends. I mean, if they started saying in, you know, Q3, mm -hmm. you know, 2022 wasn't technically published yet right so they're, they're going off of what they think right right um but at the same time and you, you probably know and we've had conversations with you know those starting that initial path the recommendation is that even if you started with 2013 transition right now before your certification audit you know so that you don't have to go through that transition audit after you get certified you know so regardless of when that stage one stage two is you know if it's you know july or later start start that process to to really get on that 2020 yeah version. so so that's interesting so we have a a, a joint client um you know a, a client here in new jersey and we got a phone call from them and they're like hey we we you know we need to go to 2022 uh mm -hmm. in, in before this year's uh, uh certification audit and uh or surveillance audit. i can't remember which one it was uh and i was like i was like okay well you realize you don't need to go that fast mm -hmm. you know you should You've got three years, technically, right? You can go all the way, unless they change that in MD26, right? October 31, 2025 is the last. There's a catch. They, they did to yeah. an extent. Did they, yeah. Oh, yeah. they change that too? <laughs> yeah. all right, hold on, hold off on that. Hold off on that for a second. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's, stay, let's stay with this particular client call because I was really surprised. And I, it was probably one of you guys that spoke with them. And, and I, was like, I was like, well, look, I said, you know, we're, we're counseling clients like, hey, y if you don't want to rush through it, don't rush through it. And, you know, and they said, well, Shellman suggested that we, we do do this. And I was like, really? I, I'm surprised. I wonder why Shellman is pushing so fast. And, and, yeah. and, and I think it was because it was their certification audit. And you guys had said that there would be a benefit to doing this during a certification cycle as opposed to yeah. during a surveillance cycle because you, 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 you save some money, right? Because you don't have the, the upcharge during the surveillance audit in the following year. Is that what I understood? Mm -hmm. They, they changed that too. Okay. John. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so basically everything I knew 30 minutes ago, I no longer yeah. know. You're going to know today. Okay. Yeah. So, so the requirement previously was if you do this in a recertification mm -hmm. that you do not have to add any additional time. Okay. Right. From an external audit perspective. Okay. So what they've done now is that you, if it's a recertification, we are required to add at least one half day to the audit time. Okay. If it's during a surveillance, we have to add one full day, whereas before that was one half day. Okay. So, we, I mean, but that's know, a, that's a relatively is, small it, savings, it, right? It I mean, it, you know, I, I don't know exactly what your rate is, but it's probably in the three thousand, thirty five hundred, four thousand yeah. dollar price range, right? So you're only talking about a, th a couple thousand dollars worth of difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's not significant, you know, with regards to the amount of time that we have to add and, and any you know kind of associated cost. Um, what we've been saying, and, and so it, hopefully the communication's not getting lost in translation, um, you know, we've been encouraging every organization to, to target the transition in 2024, okay. you know, in, unless they've gotten a head start. Okay. Mm -hmm. And reason being, and, and I think you probably know, is that, you know, some of the updates are so tied to those annual cadence activities, the risk assessment, mm -hmm. you know, the internal audits, you know, uh, making sure you go through and update your SOA. You don't want to rush that and you don't want to have the standard update, you know, really drive what your cadence is. So if organizations, you know, maybe if you Q1, they've already done that risk assessment, they've planned it, you know, and it's based on the 2013 version, you know, wait until 2024 and then do that transition then. What do you, uh, Danny, a question for you. Like, do you mm -hmm. think that there is a marketing value 
to moving to 2020, you know, to 2022 in terms yeah. of, you know, communication with your clients? Well, I think everybody's known ISO 27001 2013 for so long. I mean, it's been 10 years since it got published, right? But I do think that there is going to start to uh, be a lot of chatter in the market space. You know, this thing got published in October. It's been, what, four, four months or so. So I think there's going to be a lot of questions that start to be getting asked um, around, hey, you know, whether it's business partner, a supplier, a prospect, or a current customer, what are your plans for transitioning? Mm-hmm. So I think from a marketing perspective, um, to demonstrate that you are on the latest version of an information security standard, you know, that historically was was 10 plus years old <laughs> is, is certainly a good thing, right? It demonstrates that you're keeping up with technology and times and trends and, and whatnot. So um, to, to Ryan's point, that's why we're suggesting, hey, don't wait till the last minute. Um, yeah. You know, there's, there's certainly benefit to be had to uh, transitioning to the latest and greatest version of any, of any information security standard. Yeah, so we're ISO certified, as you, as you guys know, and yeah. we just went through our uh, mm-hmm. recertification audit uh, this past okay. week, you know, unfortunately with 2024, you guys not, no one being ready, right. To issue, you know, against 2022, yeah. we couldn't do the transition this year. Um, mm-hmm. so our thought process is we're going to do the transition next year, uh, and do yeah. it as soon as possible, you know, because obviously we look at it as being a marketing advantage. Sure. Also like it teaches us as, as you know, so that when we were helping our clients go through the transition, we can say, Hey, we've been through it. Here's what it took here. You know, here, here's, here were the here were the gotchas, if you will, right? As kind of going through the process yeah. as well. Um, so, what are the, some of the other things that would, um, you know, influence your thought process on on going through this? Um, like, so we've got this idea of certification versus surveillance audit. Do you think that that, yeah. that is something that you would do it? Um, other standards and scope. What what are some of the things that you think would would, would drive that conversation that you're having with a client is to say, hey, should yeah. we do this now or should we wait a little, you know, to the following year? Yeah, Ryan, I'll, I can jump in on this one. Yeah. Just uh, based on the, the new updates that came with this MD26 document, and we've got a blog that, that we can post that you can, uh, you can share with the show notes, John. Mm-hmm. But um, the one thing that they did was originally, to Ryan's point, they said anybody new, so if you're thinking about getting certified, you know, you would have to be basically to begin your certification audit no later than Halloween of this year, October 31st, right? So we talked about how that has subsequently been pushed back to April 30th of 2024. So they said, not only do you get an additional six months, you have 18 months if you're new, but if it's a recertification, you can start, you can't start any later than that same 18 month date. So if you're in a recertification year this year or next year, there's basically, you wouldn't be able to start, they use the word begin by, um, or begin by, begin no later than, they say, um, April 30th of next year. So if you're a recertification for next year and you're, you know, in Q1 or before 430, you, I guess you have that option. But if you're at any point later than that, May 1st forward, your, 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 your hand is, is essentially forced by this new MD, MD26. Um, well, that's kind of weird. It, it, it kind of... It disadvantages someone who happens to be in year two of their cycle as opposed to year three. That's right. So if you think about it in your case, you know, you have 2024, you have 2020. You can, you basically. Um, could go to the limit. Have, have, yeah, yeah, we, we could, could push it to, to the limit. limit. Whereas some <laughs> folks, they get cut, you know, what, what is that? Bad at math on the spot. 18 months short, really. Because yep. it's a 36 month transition on the, on the surface. But there's going to be very few firms that have the ability to take advantage of that whole thing, just depending on where they, where are, they are in their, their cadence and their, mm-hmm. in their cycle. So. Yeah. What, what about the, what about, you know, a lot of our clients are tied to, you know, uh, 27017, 18, yeah. 27701 is an important one, CSA stars. Talk about, sure. like, how that, you know, might influence this and, and when we can expect yeah. to see those fully aligned. Oh. Yeah, this is where it gets fun. Um, so a lot of those standards. You have you, know, a, you have a strange description of fun, Danny. I mean, yeah. <laughs> your fun sounds your fun sounds like Ryan's party. <laughs> we're, we're all ISO nerds here, but um, so all those. I mean, you know this, but maybe just for the listener, all those twenty-seven thousand, we'll call them family or, or sector-specific standards that you just mentioned. They all link back to the control set, which is Annex A in what is currently ISO 27001 2013, right? So 27002. Um, those, um, 
those standards haven't been updated. As far as when I say link back, they've got basically additional guidance mm -hmm. on top of what 27002 or Annex A of 27001 says. So, so for example, with, with 27018, you know, it's, it's, it's a privacy control for, for PII processors, privacy control set. So they may say, okay, okay, for control, it's the security awareness training control in, in 27001, 2013, 722. Well, in your security awareness training, you know, consider having topics that cover processing of PII or, you know, privacy considerations. Um, so those, without those standards subsequently being updated, they're basically pointing back to um, what will eventually be, you know, a, a standard that has been superseded by 27001, 2022. So it's a bit of reverse mapping that we need to do on our side. Um, it's not going to impact our clients. Uh, we haven't received any guidance that would say that's going to put their certifications at risk in any way. We can still continue to deliver our clients who do 27701, 27018, 17, all those extension standards. But we just kind of need to do a little mapping on the back end. Should they pivot to 27001, 2022 and, and say, okay, well, that mapped to, you know, control XYZ in the 2013 standard, which we know maps to mm -hmm. this control in the new version of the standard and kind of kind of do it that way. I will say of those standards that you just mentioned, it does seem like 27,017, which is you know cloud security, mm -hmm. that seven or so controls in that, in that uh, control set is going to be the first one that's gonna be updated. Uh, they mm -hmm. just released a draft international standard of that. So that one's close. I don't, whether it's sometime this year um, you know, is, is to be seen, but um, I know they're working on updates and, and a big part of that update is an alignment to the yeah. new control set of 2022. What about 27701? Because that, to me, is increasingly probably the most important of the additional yeah. guidance. Yeah, and as, as Danny said, I mean, the um, um, all of those standards that you mentioned, so ISO is going through the revision process right now just to, to get those associations updated. Um, you know, the, the challenge is, is that, you know, with, with, with anything, ISO, it's a process. You know, so they have to go through and, you know, pass it along for, you know, um, Q&A, you know, for, you know, draft feedback, comments, you know, go through their process. So it moves a little slow, but everything is in the process of getting updated. Mm -hmm. It's just in that interim, there's going to be a gap, as Danny had mentioned, you know, between, yep. you know, probably, well, now until potentially October of this year, maybe later, mm -hmm. you know, before some of those standards get published. What about... Um other attestations that are related to 27,001. So as an example, CSA stars, do we, do we know, yeah. do we know much there yet? Well, so for the CCM, mm -hmm. which is basically the cloud control matrix, you know, which all organizations have to um, uh, review for level one, level two, or, you know, eventually level three as well. Um, you know, they, they haven't updated that mapping yet. Uh, so, but, but again, because everything is already cross mapped. So you, into, so you're cross mapping your cross map yeah. right, in the same way you were talking about with the other ones. Okay. And, yeah. and then, yeah. uh, would the same hold true? Like, uh, what about something like high trust or what about, a, you know, or would there be, you know, SOC 2 isn't directly mapped to it, but I mean, if someone has a SOC 2 and an ISO 27, uh, 27,001, any, would, would there be any consideration there of? Of this there would be we're working through that as a matter of fact the ASCPA has a really great mapping mm -hmm. to the 2013 version mm -hmm. of 27001 in, in the SOC 2 criteria um, point to it you know mm -hmm. maybe weekly mm -hmm. you know so but they haven't updated their mapping to the 2022 version okay. so we're kind of in this zone of just you know having to manually as Danny had mentioned cross map you know between standards um, Again, as you know, with the 2022 version, you know, all controls from the 2013 version were, mm -hmm. you know, basically covered, you know, whether they were combined one for one. I mean, the implementation guidance was updated. So there's those 11 net new controls that somehow just can't really find that mapping. So we're going to have to manually make sure that we can draw them back to either SOC 2, high trust, CCM, whatever it may be. Gotcha. Yeah, and one other thing that, that I think would also potentially influence is if you're on a GRC platform and they haven't yet integrated 2022 yeah. into the GRC platform, uh, you know, that might negatively impact your ability to move uh, when you're ready to move, right? Yeah. Um, so we've kind of stayed focused on the technical and tactical side of the migration. 
What about moving for the real reason we we're theoretically on ISO anyway, right? I think a lot of people here are really for the attestation, right, being provably secure and compliant. But realistically, ISO is about managing risk effectively. Um, thoughts on uh, people moving to 2022 because it's a better risk management framework? And, 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 and if so, if you agree with that tenet, uh, how yeah. do you think it's a better risk management framework? What are some of the benefits that people should be thinking about? I think one of the things, <clears throat> we might have talked about this a little bit on our initial conversation, but one of the things that's interesting, you know, is, to Ryan's point, the actual framework, um, especially the ones that has to deal with the risk assessment, um, didn't really change as far as what's contained within the, the management system framework, clauses four through 10 for, for risk assessment. Um, but one of the things introduced with 27002, when that got released last February, um, were some tools and terminology, if you want to call it, to assist with the risk assessment process. All the hashtags. Uh, so, for example, controls have these things called attributes. Um, uh, so we just wanted to be we just wanted to be cool in security and, and have hashtags. I think. <laughs> exactly. I, I would have loved to exactly. sat on that committee because I would I would have just been giggling the whole time. <laughs> oh gosh, but uh, ISO has attempted being cool. So they're they're um, they, that, that did, whole intent did they was... did they do Jello shots during the during the? Oh my during... gosh, no. it was virtual. It was virtual. No, no, jello, no virtual. Jello no virtual shots. Jello shots. <laughs> Sorry, Danny. I couldn't you're resist. Good. No, you're good. I mean, like, like I said, the whole uh, as much as we can lighten up an hour long conversation about ISO, I'm all for it. But uh, yeah. The whole intent there was to facilitate the risk assessment process, making sure your bases are covered. Hey, you know, it's got now, you know, uh, labels you want to call them or attributes related to controls. It's corrective, it's preventative, it's um, detective. So it allows you to basically, or it's associated with CIRA, confidentiality, integrity, or availability, and, and a couple other categories that they've, they've put out there. And they also leave it open to, to organizations to customize for their own benefit. Uh, for identifying control owners and other purposes. But hey, you know, now it allows you to assess your whole control inventory and say, hey, look, do I only have, you know, detective controls in this area or do I have uh, not enough controls around availability? So I think it provides a little bit more visibility and less guessing maybe, uh, especially for those who are more uh, new uh, to, if you want to call it, to, uh, to these risk management frameworks, how to use them, where to get started. I mean, it's a little um, uh, intimidating maybe to, to have such a framework with, you know, what was 114 controls, now it's 93. It's still a good amount of controls for which to, uh, to, uh, to select from. So it kind of helps you narrow down those choices a little bit to hopefully more effectively manage risk within your org. Do you guys, see, do you guys think that uh, that'll be something that your auditors will be looking at, is looking at the risk assessment and saying, you know, so as an example, if they notice that in a particular Let's say that we're migrating, you know, new systems systems to the cloud. You know, did we consider not only confidentiality risk, but did we consider integrity and availability in our on our risk assessment process? And and then when we did come up with our uh, risk mitigation plans, right? Did we, like you said, did we cover corrective, detective, preventative, etc.? Do, do you guys see that that'll be part of your audit process? That your you know, your auditors will be specifically looking for that. I think they're all tools to facilitate the conversation around that. I mean, one of the things, obviously, that we're looking for in any audit, you know, surveillance research is how is how somebody might have, um, you know, incorporated changes within their certified management system. So if they move from on-prem to the cloud or whatever it might be, CSP to CSP, um, can they demonstrate that their risk assessment, you know, kind of scaled accordingly? So whether that's looking at attributes or or just the, the, the process and the, um, the methodology in general. So I think, you know, assessing change risk is, is always, you know, kind of going to be part of our approach. And, and I think these tools can help, like I said, facilitate that, that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, one of my, uh, one, one of the, you guys gave us uh, an OFI this year that I actually liked and, and complimented Joe on. Um, and it was an OFI Thank for, you. it was an OFI for we did something good in, you know, it was funny, like we, 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 we added conditional access, right? So, so conditional access at the end user level, and we have a plan to get, to get it to the device level. And, but he gave us a finding, 
uh, or excuse me, an OFI, um, because he didn't see evidence of that in the risk assessment, uh, which mm. I actually th thought was very clever, and it's really the way that you know that whole process is supposed to work. So, I do think that uh, I do think that it would be. I would be encouraged by the auditor, you know, using those attributes in the way that you discussed in being critical of our risk management process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that would be value add if you guys were actually doing that. And I think the risk assessment, I don't want to call it underrated, but it's, it is really the foundation it's of the heart. management system, right? So it's like, how do you effectively roll out controls if you haven't, um, you know, assess risk around those areas. A lot of people kind of think that's independent of, I've got a risk assessment and I've got my SOA. I need them both. But do you understand really how they work together and what the purposes is, uh, you know, of those documents and, and, you know, how one's derived from the other, et cetera. So um, 100%. It all revolves around the risk assessment and having that effective. So. Yeah, I've always said that you could, you could look at the budget request that somebody's making, and if you can't mm -hmm. find risks, then then something's wrong right because mm -hmm. you know technically right a risk is a, a mechanism that you know that mitigates risk you know if you're implementing a new control i should be able to rationalize that to the risk that it's tied to right and so that was exactly how he he used it you know and i i've said it for you so i was i i just i just laughed and he's like well and, and you could tell he was you know you know how like auditors are when they present OFIs, right? They're prepared for the fight and they soft sell it a little bit. And I'm like, no, dude, that one's, that one's awesome. <laughs> he, yeah. Oh, okay. He, yeah. he, he, he was really oh, happy. Yeah. Yeah, he was really happy. Um, That's good. So what else do you think? So, you know, I, I do agree with you. I think that'll facilitate better risk management, which is the heart of the system. Mm -hmm. um, what about some of the changes to the controls? You know, are there benefits there? So as an example, I, th I, I think, you know, 27,001, 2022 does a better job of, 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 of handling cloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's the 11 net new controls um, that got introduced, right? Because with the consolidation and everything like that, and we went down for for 21 controls from 114 down to 93. There's one control specifically, you know, I think it's security or cloud services or something along those lines. So when I first read that, actually, I thought, oh, you know, are they just, are they pivoting away and eliminating 27,017? Is this gonna be, you know, kind of, you know, consolidated into this new control set? But that, that's still gonna be there. Um, well, I think that was part of the, the, the idea behind the update was a, was a modernization of the controls and, and um, more of a uh, representation of the fact that so many people are in the cloud. There was a lot of obsolete references in that 2013 standard. So, uh, yeah, they've got they've got a control around the cloud. They've got control around data loss prevention, configuration management, secure coding, um, all of those things. I don't think should be foreign concepts uh, to a lot of organizations because with kind of the messaging that we're giving is, um, you know, if your, your ISMS has been staying up to date with, with trends in tech and, you know, yeah. um, you should be well positioned to meet this. So um, the cloud controls will still kind of take the deepest dive in, in 27,017, but uh, yeah, there are a control or two that, that are specific to that. I don't have yeah, it memorized say, yeah. yet, so. What's that? <laughs> said, I don't have that control memorized yet, but. Well, you, oh, you, yeah. you haven't had to do an audit yet. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it. Well, you know, in, in John, one thing that they did is, is you know, before it was in, just basically it was, it was information security. You know, now mm -hmm. the standard itself is information privacy and cyber security. Good point. Right. So what they're trying to do is with some of those new controls is really make sure that it's not specifically within the boundaries of the organization. You know, so you're looking at things that would be more cybersecurity, privacy related. Um, so again, as Danny had mentioned, I mean, it's it's not new. You know, there's nothing that they yeah. there, there's nothing that's uh, innovative that they're saying, hey, we, we're going to have this new control that an organization has to consider. Organizations hopefully should have already controls in place. It's just now it's defined control criteria within twenty seven thousand one. Right. I mean, more it's modernized, and so we have yeah. more. I don't want to use the term prescriptive because I think prescriptive in general ISO doesn't tend to be highly prescriptive, yeah. but it's more prescriptive, more contextualized maybe is a better word, right? I think yeah. that the guidance around cloud privacy and development has been better contextualized to the technologies and infrastructure and processes yeah. of today. 
Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's another benefit is that, mm-hmm. you know, I, and I think even just when you review the document for, with, it, with that context, I think it helps you look at risk and looks at how your control should be architected in a little bit sharper and more contextualized way. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so I do think that that's an advantage. And I think that's one of the things that we can't forget as when we're providing people guidance, because so much of the guidance is around how to do it easiest and when to do it best and what the timing is. But I think the sooner that you move, the better your ISMS is going to be. Plus, I think if you've, and I hate to say this as an ISO guy, and I love ISO, and we're ISO certified, but it's going to make you revisit a lot of your ISMS. And, and yeah. you know, we do revisit it each year, but do we do a truly deep dive or not? No. So mm-hmm. I think any time that you're going to revisit a, 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 a bake process that's been in existence yeah. for four or five or six years and right. hasn't truly been almost re-architected, you know, this idea of revisiting that with a fresh lens with new guidance, I think is going to end us, you know, your ISMS is going mm-hmm. to be better at the end of that process. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that it adds, uh, depending upon when we do it, a half a day or one day to the audit. So mm-hmm. what, you know, quote unquote, new things will the audit include? You know, what, 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 you know, if I was preparing for this, what are some of the areas that you're going to focus on that I should be prepared for? Yes, yeah, so they actually kind of published guidance around that too within within MD26. But you know, at, at a minimum, you know, <clears throat> we would be looking at those 11 net new controls. So whether we're doing it in a surveillance or a research, um, I think there's a lot of um, nerves out there that when that transition occurs, we're going to be auditing 100% of the controls, whether it's a surveillance or a recertification, right? We know that we would do that if it's a recertification because we do a full system audit. But people think, you know, if I transition to it, maybe I'll, I'll just wait to the research because you're doing it then anyway. Um, and you're, I don't want to have my surveillance be more than it, than it, uh, than it might have been otherwise. But um, that's not the case just because, you know, if, we, if we're doing it in a surveillance, say, or if we're just doing a standalone transition audit, maybe you've got a client, um, their audit's not till December and they want to be certified now. Um, we can do a transition audit. And that would basically be a focus on what's changed. So think those 11 net new controls. We know, as to Ryan's point, there's 100% of the 2013 controls got mapped over to 2022. So we know there's an implementation there. Maybe the context has changed and the verbiage has been updated or they've been consolidated, but they're still there. Um, So we know our, our bases are covered to a degree. And then you're basically looking at the management system elements that needed to have scaled accordingly. While the clauses didn't, materially change. Um, we know that you're going to have to update your risk assessment for the reasons that we just talked about. We know as a result, the risk treatment's going to change your statement of applicability. Did your internal audit cover these things? So um, those are kind of the main elements of, of what we look at beyond, you know, kind of what we do for an existing yeah. surveillance. So. Um, do you think that there are going to be specific areas of the 27,001, 2022 that people struggle with a little bit? Maybe interpretation of certain controls. Um, I've got, you know, data loss prevention has seemed to be one that has, I've had more than one client tell me immediately is going to be not applicable to them. And when I ask them why, (laughs) they think it's because they have to implement a DLP. That's the only way that they can demonstrate compliance. And if anybody knows ISO, there's not one tool or technology that you can implement to basically say, or that is required, I should say, to to meet a control, right? They're so high level. And if you read the implementation guidance in 27,002, it's paragraphs and paragraphs. So if there was one thing that you needed, it would just say that. So, but it's more than just that. Certainly a DLP, if you have that, great. Let's look at that and see how you've configured it and you know, likely it'll meet the control, but it's, it's, it can be more than just that. It can be, uh, hey, do you encrypt your backups and secure those from unauthorized access? Are you using encryption tech, technologies in general when you're, when you're sending data? So it's, it's, it, you know, there's, there's other ways to, to look at controls. They're just looking at the title of the control. Um, and it's just immediately kind of putting their hands up and being like, oh, that's, that's, that's something that won't apply to us. So I think that's why we're suggesting all the clients, because when you get 27,001, it's control title, control, no other context. That's why we're suggesting everybody to get a copy of 27,002, 
read that, understand, you know, because it's got the purpose of the control, it's got the implementation guidance, any additional context behind the intent and how you can demonstrate that you've, you've got a process in place, or if you don't have a process in place, how to potentially put one into place. So that's one thing. Yeah, and John, I would, I would add to that too, and this is kind of, you know, you, you touched on it before, you know, just in terms of preparation, right? That, that IEF MD26 document, um, it does require the certification body or the registrar to assess the organization's gap assessment to the 2022 version, yeah. as well as what their transition plan is. Hmm. So, so that's, a, that's a, actually a requirement? That's a requirement that we have to do. Wow. So if we have to do it, then so if, so if somebody made the transition but didn't conduct a gap assessment yep. and doesn't have evidence of that, that's going to create a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. glad you mentioned that. Um, I mean, I think it's the most logical way to do it anyway. But, mm -hmm. but you know, but creating a formal gap assessment is really interesting. Anything, anything else that, that you think are going to be some gotchas? Well, I mean, it, they do say that we have to assess the new audit program, hmm. yeah. you know, to make sure that that audit program taken into consideration, you know, basically going forward, addressing those controls from the 2022 yeah. version. That's a good point. Um, those are the three things. I mean, obviously, the risk assessment, as Danny had mentioned. You know, I mean, it's critical, you know, so um, an organization would have to make sure that they do go through that, you know, in, in detail, you know, not say, well, it's already good as is. We just have to kind of update the cross references to the right. controls. You know, that's that, that's that's not a, a good process, but it's those two documents, the gap assessment and the transition plan that are going to be very important, you know, and I would definitely, you know, recommend anybody that's listening to this, you know, start to go down that path you know, understand, okay, what is the Delta? We already know what it is. I mean, there's so many publications out there, but what is it relevant to your management system? Mm -hmm. And then what's your timeline? What's your plan to transition? You know, do you have the right people? You know, have you gone through the right steps? Question question for you on that transition plan. So do you, do you kind of perceive that as being a, a formal plan or, so like typically when an org does a gap assessment, you do what's called yeah. a gap remediation plan, gap treatment plan, or whatever you want to call it, right? Yeah. And imagine, I think you, you probably see this quite frequently, if they're not using a, a, a GRC platform, it's an Excel spreadsheet with, you know, columns, and you've got the, hey, we have a finding, we don't, we don't, we don't have a DLP, or we don't address the DLP, yeah. we need, so the, the remediation is we need to address DLP, right? And here's how we're going to do it. Do you consider that a transition plan, or are you going to look literally for something that looks more like a project plan, which is a list of things that, you know, with people being assigned to it and dates and, you know, thoughts? You know, I mean, I hate to say it's it's going to vary. So it's going to be open to auditor interpretation. Body. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's nothing that is formal guidance that says it has to be in this format. Right. Um, now, clearly, if, you know, you have an Excel spreadsheet, you have three columns, you've got 10 rows, and you say, this is my transition plan. You know, as we get into that audit, you know, we're going to be a little bit more... Um, we're gonna we're gonna turn over some stones. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, a bad transition yeah. plan's gonna gonna create yeah. OFIs and nonconformities yeah. in and of itself, yeah. right? So maybe yeah. you don't have one on the transition. I te technically, that, that's a really interesting question. Could you have a nonconformity on the lack of a transition plan, or would the nonconformities just yeah. be on the? Yeah. You you could technically. Because I mean, the requirements on us. Yeah, I mean, but it, but there's no but but on my side, yeah. there isn't a transition plan requirement. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you know, if you think about it, most of the time when you cite an NC, you cite an NC to a clause. An ISMS clause, yeah. or you cite it to a, an Annex A control, you, know, yeah. you wouldn't, you know, what would you cite it to there? Uh, yeah, and I think it's, you know, if, if you look at the new, mm -hmm. the, the one clause that they did add mm -hmm. to uh, 27,001, 2022, which is 6. 6.13. Okay. And it is yeah. inform, or it's Six project three. management yeah. for your information management system. Uh, yeah. So that would be a perfect place to put it, because so that's where the planning would there? be. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's yeah. so no surprises okay. if you didn't look exactly. too closely. You know, we, we can always tag it to one six one three. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. I, I thank you for pointing that out. I I, I, mm -hmm. I didn't recall that. I do remember seeing it now that, but it's been a bit. Um, I, I think that's actually really an interesting clause that they added because I increasingly I'm referring to an ISMS as yeah. just a, a a plan, a master task, right? And, mm -hmm. and I've always said for years that some of the best ISMSs that I've ever seen are ISO 9001 
are run mm -hmm. by ISO 9001 personnel, right, who tend to be those project managers, tick and tie type people. So, yeah. yeah, I think a PMP would probably be the best person. PMP who has very little security knowledge or moderate security knowledge is probably better at running your ISMS than an inf <laughs> than, a, than information security practitioner who loves yeah. bits and bytes and technology, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that planning for changes is, is a component of, of 9001. It's a component of 22301, et cetera. So I think they're also trying to make them more consistent, those management system frameworks that we all know. Yeah, that's actually an interesting question for you. Um, did they make any changes, you know, like, so I know in 2016, maybe it was, they tried to normalize mm -hmm. the management system. So 9,001 mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and um, 27,001 were aligned. Did they make any changes that would necessitate change that necessitate changes in other management systems, whether it be quality, whether it be, you know, continuity, et cetera? Yeah, yeah they actually, so the, the document that you're referring to, I'm just going to throw just a whole bunch of nasty ISO, you know, acronyms out here, but it's Annex SL. Okay. And Annex SL is the framework, it's the template for any management system standard. Oh, I didn't right? know that. Annex SL? And so, yeah, Annex SL. Now they, I think the most recent one they published captured everything, you know, because it was, I think it was 2015. Okay. So that 20, that 9001 2015 already mm -hmm. had that format. Okay. And then thereafter, the 22301, which was 2019, 20,000-1, which is 2018, and now this mm -hmm. one, you know, this, this 27,001, 2022, uses that same template. So they, you know, they, they are, as, as Danny mentioned, basically kind of harmonizing exactly how an, a management system is going to be demonstrated, you know, in, in, in a document to Yeah. Yeah. Um, we beat this up pretty good. Anything we miss? Just get that get that that MD twenty six document. Yeah, I will. I will, I. It's on my. You saw me taking notes <laughs> with my pen and paper, because if I type, it makes a racket. So now yeah. now I just have to not lose the, the piece of paper, which I'm I'm yeah. I'm fifty fifty probably. Um, <laughs> so so Danny was kind enough to point out. He said, "Hey, should you change the amazing or horrible CISO question?" Because we both answered that already. And so I thought about it a little bit, and I said I'm going to, but I'm not going to tell them ahead of time. Yeah, because I, I want to test. I want to test to see who can think quickest on their feet. So I'm going to make Let's it a it. relatively easy one. Give me a fictional character or real person that would make an amazing or horrible new quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And by the way, <laughs> Shelman is located in Tampa, so this is very contextualized. Oh, right, come on. That was kind of a brilliant question when you think about it, right? You guys are from Tampa. Yeah. You know, and why? Shane Falco from The Replacements. That's Keanu Reeves. <laughs> <laughs> He's the first uh, fictional quarterback that came to my mind. <laughs> Oh, he was great. He was he was a team player. People rallied around him. No ego. Kind of came in very unassuming. So he'd be he'd be definitely a different flavor from Brady. But uh, yeah, uh, we'll see if Keanu's up that for was, the task. That was pretty damn good, Danny. All right, so Ryan, give me a real world quarterback that you're hoping comes to Tampa Bay. Uh, I um, oh gosh, you got to put me on the spot now. I was thinking of of um, uh, yeah. I think Tom Brady should come back. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he's left yet. Uh, Giselle, Giselle d disagrees. Oh, just, God. Just give him, give him a month. You know, he's going to feel that uh, itch. You know, it's a little PTO. He's going to, you know, practice squad, next thing you know. Yeah. So. I thought you were going to go with Jimmy um, G. I thought you were going to go with Jimmy G. I, I mean, I think that'd be a great fit. I do. Yeah. I really do think that'd be a great fit. I've seen a lot of names out there and, and kind of concerning, you know, some of them. Oh, some of them. I think it's just it's, it's a band-aid and it's going to just create another problem yeah. but um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. well listen uh, as a as a f a long suffering fan of a team that has not had a quarterback in 50 years the new york jets i'm uh, hoping that you don't get anyone I, i'm hoping you get someone good after i get somebody good <laughs> i think the last one was what testaverde uh, i oh, really enjoyed those days oh yeah, yeah i mean yeah i mean you know chad pennington before he blew out his shoulder yeah. kenny o'brien mm -hmm. was a pretty solid quarterback yeah. the problem with kenny o'brien was we took him before dan marino yeah mm -hmm. you know we could have taken dan marino and yeah. we took kenny o'brien instead <laughs> yeah it's just the, the pain of being a jet fan all right, guys, if uh, folks want to get in contact with uh, you, you guys, what's the easiest way to do that? Shelman or you guys? Yeah, LinkedIn. 
I mean, it's the mm-hmm. easiest way, you know, just reach out to us. I mean, profiles are out there, the firm's out there, you know, so happy to do that. Our website, Websites, we've got a lot mm-hmm. of content, that uh, blog, as Danny had mentioned, um, you know, and we've got a, um, um, you know, a way to contact anybody on our team, you know, through our website, so. Awesome. Two great ways, yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, here's the good news. It's 3.54 on a Friday. Yeah, you can. For me and you, John. That's oh, for Danny. oh, Danny. After so Danny's just getting started. Oh, Danny. Sorry. Well, listen, you know, <laughs> you as, pour as, some of that Death as, Wish coffee and as, see where they have to Yeah, you're, you're going to start on a Death Wish coffee. I'm going to start on a bourbon. <laughs> there you go. All right, guys. Jealous. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, John.